So the access is getting that data together in, um, in a form that we can work with, all right? And there's three pieces to it. You've got to have the human workflow, all right? You've got to train people. How do you get to a journal? How do you download it? Okay, you know, how do I get this into a database? You've got the partial automation, which is things that, uh, like scripts and stuff like that. And then there's like the full automation, which is probably what some of you guys do with text mining, natural language processing, op optical character recognition. My lab mostly resides in Sage 1 and 2, but we are basically picking up a lot more on the full automation and trying to bootstrap our way towards a fully automated bio curation. All right, using manual curation with partial automation, we can get full capture. Um, 100 to 200 minutes. If it's a short article, you, you might get it in about 50 minutes, but we essentially recapture every data point that's been published in an article, all right? Same way with patients, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is what the experimental database looks like. So we use the structure of the paper to dictate what the fields are in our database, because that's the only thing these that they have in common is the structure of the paper, because the experiments are so different, right? So we have the document, the figure table, with the data series, and the response value. So as you go into the paper, you can get deeper and deeper into the point where like, we're extracting that data point. But we also give you everything else you need to know. Okay, what was the mouse genotype? What was the method? What are the units? What was the onset in that mouse? What was its death? So everything you need, the context, to be able to use this data and to aggregate it with something else. And um, you can access, um, the part of the database um, online, all right? So using this method of the structure of the paper to dictate how we gather the data, um, we have 99% accuracy. Um, we have like almost 100,000, probably is 100,000 by the time, um, you know, I've updated my number. We get uh, somewhere about 15,000 data points a day, something like that, it's, it's pretty, pretty good. Um, usually PhDs are what do biocuration, all right, in industry it's all PhDs, but our undergraduates actually have a higher accuracy than our PhDs, and I think that says us a lot about the motivation of students and their, their willingness to learn and what to, to produce, um, so that's pretty exciting. All right, this is what clinical record curation looks like. So there's kind of this misnomer that in, you've heard of electronic medical records, all right, so really that's not true. Electronic medical records means I filled out a form and somebody scanned it. That's all that means, all right? It's not a beautiful database that you can go in and, and just, like, download data and start doing analysis. Far from it, okay? So a lot of times it may even just be a doctor that dictated for, you know, 15 minutes or whatever about a patient that's never in the same spot. It may have units. It may not. And so what we do is we send our bio curators through, and then they grab all the information they can. And we kind of figure out a data path to figure out, like, well, for example, muscle strength, all right? So muscles are graded one to five, each muscle, bicep, tricep, quadricep. Um, that's one thing. We may get all of their medications, all their cognitive tests, anything that is measured in the clinic, we grab, all right? And then we aggregate it, which brings me to our next topic. After you've gotten all your disparate data sets, you've gotten your data path, you've gotten it curated, and they're like, now what, all right? So we have apples, oranges, lemons, all that thrown into our database, and it's kind of structured by the structure of the paper or the structure of the, of the electronic medical record. Now we've got to be able to aggregate in a way that we can use it for analysis, all right? So there are two ways to aggregate. The most common one is the physiology-based method. So that's where I use what I know about physiology to come up with a classification or ontology that makes sense to me. All right, so energetics equals mitochondria, you know, endoplasmic reticulum, you can keep going deeper and deeper. But another way to do it is actually data-driven uh, aggregation where you use the data to tell you what's related, which is really cool because there's a lot of times in, um, you know, biology that we don't know all the, the pathophysiology stuff. Like if we don't know what the relationships are, we can actually use the data itself a text mining and hierarchical clustering to tell us how it should be classified. All right. So the point of this is to get an ontology so that you can aggregate. Right. Then we have relationships, and then uh, finally you want to be able to actually get down to data points that you could put into your model. All right. Okay. So 
the first step after um, getting all that data in there is we want to build a map. All right, this is an example of a pathophysiology based map. All right, so in ALS, we have um, up here nine categories of nine to ten, depending on how you think about it. We pulled genetics out. Genetics could be one, but we, we pulled out um, nine. All right, so this, um, if you can look over there, we have all the journals, and then we use our knowledge about what we do know and in order to figure out like how much research is there on each of these topics. So that the size of the box it actually tells you um, how much research has been done in that area. Okay? So this is pathophysiology based. But what we could also do is a, a data driven model where like something like calcium, which is related to not only energetics but also excitotoxicity, you can use how data aggregates to say, does it fit better with excitotoxicity or excitability, or does it fit better with energetics? Because you know some of these players will cross multiple ontologies, all right? So um, once you kind of have a map of like, okay, this is the amount of data we have across all the different fields, all right? Then we can focus on getting the relationships, all right? So now you can see over here, we have our journal articles, we have what we know about the physiology, we have the individual data, and we have our map, all right? And then what we do is we try to figure out what are the relationships between inflammation and excited toxicity, inflammation and free radicals, right? So the thickness of the arrow represents how strong that relationship is or its magnitude, all right? And sometimes with this aggregation scheme, the goal is like each arrow has at least 10, you know, publications behind it, right? Because you, you want that reproducibility, the more that you can have, right? But you also don't want to get so aggregated that you, you start to lose resolution. So you kind of have to have that balance um, between those two, right? But these relationships are important. Now it starts to look like something you would have in conservation principles, right? Some big material balance that you get to do. And that's pretty much kind of what it is. Only you have different, uh, each pipe kind of has different stuff in it. Um, but the, what makes this balance is the stability of the system, eigenvalues, all right? So what we want to do is in a, in a pathophysiological system, we want it to be stable. So we can use the eigenvalues of the model solution of how these things change over time to determine whether it's stable or not, all right? So that's the relationship. So once you have all your relationships and your map, then you can actually start plotting things like rotorod, right? So this is rotorod. Uh, the, in the blue is one type of mouse model, and a green is another type. They're both SOD1 GD93A, but there are two variations. And it used to be, prior to this publication, that everybody thought that you could just aggregate those, and they were good. But if you look closely, you'll see that there's definitely a different trend line between the green circles and the blue circles. And so, um, depending on what you're doing, you can't necessarily always aggregate these. Had you not, went through the process of aggregating from 700 journal articles, you wouldn't know this. You would just be dogma. And that's the problem with a lot of biomedical sciences. Dogma kind of dictates our knowledge. And sometimes we need to just plot the data and see what we get. All right, and then the size of those circles indicates the sample size. So like, for example, every paper, somebody measured it in three mice, 10 mice, 100 mice, all right? So we keep that because that's important because you want to have your standard deviations later when you have uh, build your model. All right. You can also do this with clinical data. This is an example of probability of survival uh, for 1,500 patients. Um, and we can use both quantitative and qualitative data uh, to dictate what that probability of survival looks like and use relationships um, to do so. All right. Now into the analyze phase, which I suspect most of you are probably the most interested in. Usually when we analyze, we think about forecasting something, right? So we all watch the weather and we want to determine, do we need to bring an umbrella tomorrow or, you know, what are we going to wear? Well, that's kind of how computational and predictive medicine is too, right? We want to predict what's next on the horizon. Where should experimentalists look next? And where should clinicians or the FDA, where, you know, we want to make sure whatever we propose is, is likely to succeed. Most of you guys probably reside in either the traditional statistics realm or the mechanistic modeling realm. Uh, traditional statistics is like regular meta-analysis, um, you know, or you might do some sort of Bayesian method. Um, mechanistic modeling is, you know, your standard first-order modeling um, that you 
kind of have like the chemical kinetics for and, and you, you know like A plus B goes to C plus D and I can use my stoichiometry and I can figure it out. We know what the answer is. So mechanistic modeling is awesome when, when you have uh, the data and the knowledge to do it, but as so is traditional statistics. But what happens when you don't have all the pieces? Well, most people end up doing what we call black box modeling uh, or curve fitting, right? But curve fitting has a downside that you don't have any conceptual knowledge of what's going on. All you know is that if I kind of fit this thing and this is the answer, but we don't know why. So the nice part about de novo systems modeling or dynamic modeling is the relationships tell us what we don't know, all right? I don't have to know why the relationship is there. I have to know that it's there. And then you can, like, put all those relationships together um, to figure out what this disease is doing. And this works because of complex systems theory, right? Then we also have the machine learning and optimization. That's a really cool field that's up and coming. Um, and that's, like, where you train the data. Um, you have training sets and, you know, you want to, like, if I do this 100 times, what are the chance that I'll get a certain outcome? And that's really good, uh, too, for helping better tune models. All right? So the system dynamics method here, we use um, the relationship map that we developed, and we have a series of gains. If you can imagine, each arrow has a, a feedback on it, okay? Uh, and it's a, it's a feedback game, just like you are at a plant. We're measuring the pressure upstream. We're going to change the valve. What happens, right? So you can use this feedback, just like you would in engineering, to figure out what are the difference between an ALS mice and a wild-type mouse. And usually what happens in ALS is that the gains are either way too high or way too low. So really, it's not necessarily just what caused the initial perturbation. It's that... The, the feedback is wrong. And if we could fix the feedback, then we could maybe fix ALS, right? Do you understand the difference between a feedback problem versus a feed problem, right? So you could have a problem in your system because the feed you put in was the wrong composition, or you could have a problem in your system because your gains are wrong on your system. And so what we're trying to focus on is the gain aspect. And how does an ALS system react to perturbation compared to a wild-type system or a normal mouse, all right? And typically, they overreact, okay? All right, so when you do this, you can model over time. This is our, our uh, ontologies I talked about. This is the 10 ontology model. You can see what they look like over time. And that little one over there to your left, that's from about 0 to 100 days. Keep in mind that onset is about 85 days. And what do you notice? When the oscillations start to get big, that's when the onset happens. That's not by you know, chance. That's the disease, OK? So when the, the oscillations are, are milder, they don't have symptoms. But when the oscillations get too big, then you have, you have symptoms. So we use computational modeling and this dynamic meta-analysis method with the gains to say, what if our goal was to perturb the system any number of ways, and we just want to restabilize it. What would, can we do that? And what we did is we tuned, um, we did optimization algorithms uh, for three different gains, okay? Three gains, and I think there is like um, 180 gains or something in the system. So that's a lot of permutations that you, you can use. But it, can we change three of the gains with some sort of therapy and get this thing to restabilize, all right? Irrespective of what the initial perturbation was, it doesn't matter if it's axonal transport or energetics, doesn't matter. All we want to do is get it to restabilize. And it turns out that there are actually about 2% of the combinations, 100 plus thousand combinations, can restabilize, or at least partially restabilize, um, to the point to where you would uh, cease progression. You may not get back what you got because you have neurological damage, but you would cease progression of the disease. Um, and so, what we're trying to do now is build more resolution into our model with, with more data, right, to be more reproducible, to, and then figure out which of these are the best that we can target them experimentally. Actually, not us, but have our experimental friends target them uh, and try this new approach where we're not so caught up on what caused it, but rather the compensatory mechanisms that change as the disease progresses. All right? Um, Although I'm really hepped up on dynamic meta-analysis and stability and all that, I want to say that there's still a lot to be learned from even traditional meta-analysis. So even if you just aggregate data using a bio-curation uh, method, you can look at 
traditional mechanisms, uh, you can still see some of the oscillations that we talk about and convergences that happen 